<sighs> Brilliant. Can we turn our Bibles, please, to Ruth chapter 2, chapter 2, chapter 3. We've gone backwards in time there. Ruth chapter 3, we're on our third chapter in this book. So Ruth chapter 3, not a long chapter, 18 verses, going to read the whole thing. Ruth chapter 3. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And now is not Boaz of our kindred, with whose maidens thou wast? Behold, he winnoweth barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man, until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall come, and it shall be, when he lieth down, that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie. And thou shalt go in and uncover his feet, and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me, I will do. And she went down unto the floor, and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his, heart was merry, and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn. And she came softly, and uncovered his feet, and laid her down. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid, and turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast shown more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requirest. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. And now it is true that I am thy near kinsman. Howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. Tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning, that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, well let him do the kinsman's part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee. As the Lord liveth, lie down until the morning. And she lay down at his feet until the morning. And she rose up before one could know another. And he said, Let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. Also he said, Bring the veil that thou hast upon thee, and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six measures of barley, and laid it on her. And she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, who art thou, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done to her. And she said, These six measures of barley gave he me. For he said unto me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. Then said she, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall. For the man will not be in rest until he hath finished the thing this day. Can we just pray again, please? Lord, we thank you for thy word. We thank you that it is, Lord, perfect in every single way. And that, Lord, we are able in this land to open up thy word once again this morning. Without fear of persecution, Lord, we just pray now, teach us. Teach me too. From thy word, may it be a blessing, an encouragement, a challenge to us. But may we once again... Seek, Lord, just to glorify and to exalt thy precious and holy name above all else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're on our third chapter of Ruth today. Right, and I'm not going to go through every single thing verse by verse, but I'm going to pick up on just a few things that have really jumped out at me from this portion of Scripture. So, we'll start off. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter... Shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? Now this is great because Naomi is concerned for Ruth. She has a genuine concern for her daughter-in-law. 
and parents in the room, okay, you know that feeling that you have. You have a concern for your children, for their well-being. You want them to be happy usually, usually. You want them, unless you're my mum by any chance, you want them to do well. You want them to have all the good things that they can have. And Naomi has a genuine concern for Ruth. And she's thinking about her future. She's thinking about what will be best for her. And this is why she makes this suggestion to her. And now is not Boaz of our kindred, with whose maidens thou wast. Behold, he winner of barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man, until he hath, shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lieth down, that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie. Thou shalt go in and uncover his feet, and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And she said unto her, all that thou sayest unto me, I will do. Now this is an unusual request, is it not? I mean, if I woke up and there was a woman lying at the, my feet and it wasn't Mary, I would be incredibly concerned. <laughs> however, however, I read in one commentary, and I don't know how accurate this is, I honestly don't know, that it is a common tradition in the Orient. It was something that servants would often do. They would lie down at the feet of their masters. How, how true that is, I don't know. Read it in one commentary. But what I do know is this. Being at someone's feet, it's, it's a sign of humility. It's a sign of humbleness. You know, when Jesus Christ washes the feet of his disciples, he, he, was, he was making himself his servant. He was showing that sort of servant... Is quality. I know that's not a word, but I can't think of the word now. Um, when Mary comes to Jesus and she washes his feet and anoints him and kisses his feet and wash and uses her hair to, to wipe his feet. Again, sign of a servant. And here Ruth has been commanded, go in, lie down at his feet. She's not seeking to sort of promote herself. She's not seeking to, to want to be on that same level as Boaz, who was an important man in this place. She simply goes in to lie down at his feet, saying, look, I, I'm a servant. I'm your handmaid. I'm your servant. But the other thing is this. She was obedient. She was obedient. And remember how we've talked about in the past, how Ruth is a picture of the church. At some point, if you have become a Christian, you've had to acknowledge your sin, you've had to acknowledge the wrong that you have done, you've had to recall the words of Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, you've had to come to Jesus, you've had to acknowledge him, that he is the way, the truth and the life, that he is the only one who can save, and you have to be obedient to that fact of the scripture, to come, to come. Now, we're not saved by our works, God forbid. Bible says, for by grace are you saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But coming to Jesus, asking him, recognising he's the only way, that's still an act. Still something you've got to do. Still something you've got to do. But you have to be obedient to that instruction in Scripture. You have to be obedient. And God expects us to be obedient. Now, some of the tasks we see men ask throughout the Bible, think back to Abraham, how Abraham was asked to offer up his son. That's obedience. He went and he was willing to do that. Here Ruth has been told, go prepare yourself, lie down in his feet. She goes and does it, follows it to the letter. She doesn't change it. She does exactly what she's been told to do. That's obedience. And are we obedient this morning? Do we read our Bible? Do we allow it to change us? Do we allow God to instruct us? How obedient are we to God? Can we say like Isaiah said, here am I, send me. Can we honestly do that? And I'm saying this this morning, but I'm also talking directly to myself. Easy to preach, much harder to do in in actual fact. But she goes and does it. It's a strange request. We might be thinking to ourselves, 
Oh, you know, that's, that's a bit, bit of a grey area. How virtuous, how, how good an idea is this? Could this lead to something else? No. Think about the character of Naomi. Think about the character of Boaz. Think about the character of Ruth. If there is any indecency in this act, Naomi wouldn't have suggested it. If there is any indecency in this act, Boaz would have commented so. If there is any indecency in this act, Ruth, and she's commented as a virtuous woman, would not have done it. There's nothing indecent in this act. Nothing indecent whatsoever. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn. And she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. Not unusual. Why is he sleeping? Why is he sleeping in the threshing floor? Why? Well, Naomi knew he was going to be there. Interesting, really, because you'd have always assumed he'd have gone to bed. He'd have gone to his bedroom, slept in his bed. But Naomi knew he would be on the threshing floor tonight. Why? Why? It was a tradition. The master would often, at this particular time of the year, he would sleep on the threshing floor to protect... And there's lots of ideas and reasons for this, which one we don't know, but to protect the harvest. That seems to be the most common sense, obvious example. And I like the fact that people turn around and say about how, how bad the world has become. And the world has become very evil, but the world has always been evil in, in sense, because men... Men are naturally simple creatures. So he's sleeping to protect the harvest. And Christ talks about this in the New Testament. He says about protecting the harvest. So he's sleeping there to protect it. Now that's great because if he wants a midnight snack, he doesn't have to go very far, does he, really? You know, he's just got to get up and grab himself a handful. So if you're a hungry person in the night, brilliant. But this is interesting. He'd eaten and drunk and his heart was merry. You know... The argument here is his heart was made. I've heard people turn around and say, well, if his heart's made and he's been drinking, implies he's been at the alcohol. Probably not. No. He's finished a job. He's, he's sleeping down. He's, ha he's happy. If he'd been drinking, he probably wouldn't... He'd probably sleep, regardless of whether a thief came in or not. And judging from his character, I think it's quite unlikely that he's been on the alcohol. Okay? Very unlikely indeed. What I would surmise from this is that he's happy, he's accomplished something. The harvest is done. The, the fruits of his labour are right next to him. It's like a teacher. Last day of school. They are merry. It doesn't mean they've been drinking. They're quite happy. They've finished the year. They got through. All the children have made progress, hopefully. Ideally. But they're happy, they're merry. Doesn't mean anything else. And he's merry. He goes to sleep. Now, what I've learned about, from, about Boaz here is he's a very sound sleeper. Because he doesn't notice Ruth come in, uncover his feet, and lie down. There is a few, I'm guessing there's a few people in here that are sound sleepers in the same way. Mary, for instance, when she goes to sleep, that's it. You can watch a film, can't you, Colin? And there's no stirring her. No stirring her whatsoever. And Boaz is the same. He's a very sound sleeper. Ruth's able to come in to lie down at his feet, and he doesn't even notice that she's there. Doesn't even notice. In fact, it's a few hours later when he actually does notice. He says, and it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. Yeah, I'm not surprised he was afraid. Right. And he said, who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And he said, Blessed be thou of the law, my daughter. For thou hast shown more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. Now remember that Boaz is a picture of Christ in the scriptures. And he's pointing out to Ruth, you know, blessed be you, because you've, you've not followed after a young man. This implies that Boaz is obviously an older man as well. But the thing is, here he's saying, why, you know, you picked me. Essentially, you picked me. You could have picked somebody else, but you've picked me. 
And you know what? When we read about Jesus Christ in Isaiah 53, if you want to turn there, it's a fantastic chapter. Absolutely fantastic. Sort of almost, it's past Psalms, just a little past the sort of midway point. Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Jesus Christ wasn't the most beautiful person who ever walked the earth, physically speaking. It says here, he hath no form nor comeliness. There is no beauty that we should desire him. She's not following Boaz because he's beautiful, because he's young. She's following him because he's the right choice for her. And there's no beauty in Jesus Christ either. So why? Why Jesus Christ? Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. Also, it's interesting here. Verse 11. And now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requirest. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. He was the only one who could redeem her. The only one. And near kinsman. And near kinsman was necessary to redeem her. To redeem the land that had been Naomi's husband. He was the only one around who could redeem her. The only person. And there's only one way to God this morning. That is through Jesus Christ. Just as Boaz was Ruth's redeemer, Jesus Christ is our redeemer. For we are not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but shall have everlasting life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is one this morning. There is only one way to God, and that is through Jesus Christ. He is the only one who can wash away sins. He is the only one who can redeem us. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Only one who can redeem us. Boaz was the only one who could redeem Ruth. Jesus Christ is the only one who can redeem us. But the great thing here is. Thou art a virtuous woman. Do you know what? He looked at her reputation. And redeemed Ruth. Didn't have to. He chose to. He redeemed her. But she was a virtuous woman. What about us? Can we say the same about us? Are we virtuous? You know what? God will redeem the vilest sinner. He's able to save to the uttermost. It doesn't matter how bad your sin is this morning. It doesn't matter what you have done this morning. It doesn't matter how unvirtuous you are. God can save you through Jesus Christ this morning. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And now it is true that I am thy near kinsman. How be it, there is a kinsman nearer than I. Tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning, that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman's part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee, as the Lord liveth, lie down until this morning. You know what? Boaz is going to observe the law to the letter. Um, Be good at this point, just turn left in your Bible to Deuteronomy 25. Because this is going to be very relevant, particularly when we come to chapter 4 next time. So it would be good for us to just have a look over this now. Deuteronomy 25, verse 5. I've written it down as well, so I'm turning there myself. You'll probably find it quicker than me. Deuteronomy 25, verse 5. Okay. There we are. If brethren dwell together, and one of them die, and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her, and take her to him to wife, 
and perform the duty of an husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she bears shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders and say, My husband's brother refuseth to raise up unto his, brother's, his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of the city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I like not to take her, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe off his foot and spit in his face and shall answer un and say, So shall it be done unto the man that will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him who hath his shoe loosed. That's really important. Where's that drink? What he's trying to say here is, it's the brother, the immediate brother, that has that right to redeem first and foremost. And Boaz is going to observe the Bible. You know what? Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter what the law is. He's going to follow it. You know what? We get lots of modern preachers today. Lots of new types of Christians. You know, the modern Christian. And they think to themselves, I don't like this part of the Bible. They pick, they choose, they change it. And the Bible tells us that the word of the Lord are pure words, a silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt preserve them, O Lord, thou shalt keep them from this generation forever. We're lucky this morning. I say lucky, it's not lucky, it's, it's God's blessing to us that we have a perfect copy of the word of God in front of us. And you know what? Lots of people are going to mess around with the scriptures, but we won't. We're going to keep to this book as much as we physically can. This man, he knows the law. How well do we know our Bibles? This is a man, Boaz is a man, who has clearly spent time studying the scriptures, studying the word of God. What about us? How much time do we spend studying the book of the word of God. Colin preached yesterday on Isaiah 49 and 50. About the importance of having that time in the morning. That time just to meditate. To be with the Lord. <coughs> and it is so important. So important to have that time in the morning. Just to, to read the word of God. And to grow. He doesn't question the law. No matter what it says. <sighs> And she lay down at his feet until the morning, and she rose up before one could know another. And he said, Let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. You see here, Boaz is still concerned about his reputation. You know what? I meet lots of Christians. There was one Christian years ago. I won't name the church. I won't name the person. But I went to school with her. And she started attending a church, and she'd become a Christian, she said. Anyway, uh, I had her on Facebook. Now on Facebook you see all the photos of what people are doing. And there's pictures of her on this website, the church's website, oh, her testimony and everything else. But then on her Facebook profile, the pictures of her going out, drinking, getting drunk, you know, complete immorality. She's not actually worried about her testimony, is she? Let's be blunt, she's, she doesn't care. Either that or she doesn't think it's important. Boaz is concerned about his reputation. Boaz is concerned, and quite rightly so. He's an important man. And what he doesn't... He knows what people are like. People will gossip. People make things up. People think the worst. Because the heart is wicked and deceitful. But he's worried about his testimony. He's worried about his reputation. Do we worry about ours? We should. Because once you've lost your testimony, once you've lost your reputation, it's, you're not going to get it back. You're not. You have to think about it. And it's always interesting. The world will always turn around to you and say, Ah, the world, if you want to know whether something's right for a Christian, the world will tell you. You know? I had, I went out for a meal with staff from work years ago. And um, they're talking about why I don't swear. And they said, why don't you swear? I said, because I'm a Christian. And there's an idiot standing pretty much next to me who's supposed to be a Christian saying, Oh, but I swear. You know, I don't think it's a problem. I'm a Christian, I swear. Yeah, I swear. Well, clearly you've never read the scriptures. <coughs> also, he said, bring the veil that thou hast upon thee and hold it. 
And when she held it, he measured the six measures of barley and laid it on her, and she went into the city. Now this is a quote, I think, from Matthew Henry. He attempted not to take advantage of Ruth. He did not disdain her as poor, destitute stranger, nor suspect her of any ill intentions. He spoke honourably of her as a virtuous woman, made her a promise, and as soon as the morning arrived, sent her away with a present to her mother-in-law. Quote from Matthew Henry. And why, why I like this? It's because he didn't, you know, he didn't disdain her. As a poor, destitute stranger, she got nothing. Ruth had nothing. She got nothing to bring to Boaz. Nothing to offer Boaz. What can we bring to Christ? There isn't anything. There is no good in us. All our righteousness is as filthy rags. There's no good in us. Nothing we can bring. But what we have is we have a saviour who loves us anyway. A saviour who loved us so much he went to the cross of Calvary. A saviour who loved us so much he died in our place upon that cross. And that's love. That's love. It's also interesting that he gave her that six measures of barley. You know what? When you go to God, you'll always end up with more than you deserve. Because we don't deserve salvation. We don't deserve eternal life. We don't deserve the gift of the Holy Spirit. We don't deserve these things. Now people might think about it in terms of finance. They might think about it in terms of material possessions. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about spiritual blessings. Because you've got a friend that's close to a brother. You've got a God you can go to day, night, any time. You've got salvation, eternal life. These are the blessings. God always gives more than we deserve. And she came to her mother-in-law and said, And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Who art thou, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done to her. And she said, These six measures of barley gave he me. For he said to me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. Then said she, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how this matter will fall. For the man will not be in rest until he had finished the thing this day. Do you know something? He didn't rest. He didn't hesitate to do the right thing. You know what? I get, it's very interesting. Many years ago, they'd say a man's word is his bond. That hasn't been the case for a long time, I suspect. Somebody says to you, right, we're going to be at your house at this time. Not necessarily. Somebody says to me, I'm going to do that. I'll get you the paperwork. Not necessarily. Very off record now. Um, no, I won't pause it. But you'd be amazed how many times people say, oh, I'll send this into the office. Okay? I'll send this in for you. And then one week later, it hasn't come. And two weeks later, it hasn't come. Three weeks later, it hasn't come. <coughs> I phone them and say, um, have you sent the paperwork? Yeah, we sent it. When did you send it? Weeks ago. Okay. And then it turns up about a month later. With a date that says... You know, that day just, just before it's come. So no, they haven't done what they said they were going to do. They haven't done it. Man's word is his bond. And Boaz doesn't hesitate to do the right thing, do we? Interestingly enough, Naomi says, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how this matter will fall. There was a great sermon that John Herrick preached, which is actually on the website, I believe now. If you turn to Isaiah 30, verse 7, back just past the Psalms, again, past the uh, Proverbs and so on, just past the midway point of the Bible, Isaiah 30, verse 7. Isaiah 30, verse 7. Um... For the Egyptians shall help in vain, and to no purpose. Therefore have I cried concerning this. Their strength is to sit still. Yeah. Not always an easy thing to do. Yeah. But that is what Ruth had to do. And that is sometimes what God would require us to do. When I was praying to the Lord about whether it's time to move on from my current job, I hadn't got a clue. Thank God, I've been praying for a long time. But do you know something? I didn't move until the Lord moved me. Didn't move. 
And when it was God's time to move me, he showed me with no doubt. And there wasn't any doubt about it. I didn't even know the job that I've got now had come up. It was Mary who noticed it. I don't know how she even got word of it. Um, When I got the job, it was fantastic. And the Lord's brought me out of that. The thing is this. Sometimes it is God's will to sit, God's will for us to sit still. I know I'm not going to preach on that now because John Hewitt has done it far more ably than I would. If you want to, have a listen to the sermon again. It's on the, the website. Fantastic sermon. All right. So, just a few thoughts from Ruth chapter 3 this morning. Next time, Ruth chapter 4, we'll finish it off. Trust it was a blessing to each and every one of us. Amen.